one of the most difficult things for me to deal with in this industry is the quantity of general sayings that have no base or uh, technically are correct but no one understands why you know it just drives me nuts when people will spout off some information that they read once or heard once or experienced one time on one engine and then set that as you know the fact from, from you know forever uh, and you hear them all the time typically it's you know around the old V8 guys you all this you know Dorkwin's races and you know horsepower this and you gotta have more plenum volume and they, they make all this shit up and then and no one really knows you know what it is well the one that's bugging me the most today is this whole spark debate on Gilda VFI tuners people are talking about oh you gotta have 0.9 millimeters of gap like if you can't do that then then your ignition system sucks well you know that's just that's ignorant plain ignorant I mean especially when half the production cars that are forced induction from the factory come 0.7 I mean that's just whatever man so what I want to do is I want to talk about spark plug gap and how it's affected by cylinder pressure and what that is. People always call it blowing out spark. And I know that's a, that's a, a common term that's been accepted, but really it's, that's not even close to what's really going on. It's, 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 a, it's a quench of the spark or, or something along those lines. Blowing it out is just something I think they use because when someone turned the boost up, all of a sudden the spark stopped working. And like, man, my spark not working. Was he blowing it out with all that turbo flow? You know, blah, so much air, blah, whatever. So, anyways, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach you guys a little bit about about spark plug gap and uh, and why it changes with boost levels. And you know, honestly, it's it's super simple. Um, and once uh, once I tell you, you're gonna go, huh, son of a bitch, that was really easy. Uh, and then also, I want to make a statement beforehand, and that is that. There is no such thing as a universally acceptable amount of dwell. There just isn't. It totally depends on what coil packs you have. Every coil pack has a different kind of resistance. Every coil pack has a different amount of windings in it, you know, and different, you know, size windings, number of turns, type of uh, core. All that stuff is going to affect how fast that field is produced in the coil, how big it gets, and when it stops expanding. Um, and so for someone to say, oh, you got to have 2.7 seconds or 2.7 milliseconds of dwell, or you got to have 4 milliseconds of dwell, you got to find that, <laughs> no, like, wrong. Each coil pack has its limits for what it can do. You know, coil packs with lower resistance are going to charge fast. That field's going to, you know, uh, get to full size before it stops expanding. Um, and coil packs with more internal resistance are going to take longer to charge up. Also, the the coil itself, you know, the inductor is, you know, a huge part of it. Uh, there's this thing called counter electromotive force that exists inside of all motors, generators, and coils. And you have to know, you know, what that trend uh, or what that force is doing as the coil charges. So, onto the simpler stuff spark plugs. Now, what's a spark plug? Spark plug essentially is just two conductors, right? So, I'm going to draw. Nothing because this pen is dead. You know, it worked great yesterday. Okay, next. Two conductors. All right. Positive, negative. Or the other way around. But if you got wasted spark, it's this way or whatever. So one side is going to be the engine block, and one side is going to be the coil. Okay. And all we're doing is we're trying to generate enough voltage to jump this distance between these two conductors. So if you were looking at a spark plug, you got the strap, comes over, this is part of the threaded body, right, and it grounds out to the block via the threads. Then internally you have your insulator and the other electrode, okay? So here's our spark plug. So what we need to do is we need to generate enough voltage to jump this air gap right here. Most automotive coils are in the 30,000, 40,000, you know, volts range, and that's more than enough energy to jump a gap that's, you know, um, 30 to 65 thousandths of an inch. No problem. But what dictates how much energy it takes to jump that gap? Well, it would be the resistance, right? Air and fuel are very poor conductors of electricity. To 
pass electricity from this point to this point if I had a wire in there would take almost no voltage because there's no resistance in that metal wire. But when I take that wire out, now I have all this air and fuel in between it, and now I have resistance. So air and fuel are technically a conductor of sorts. If you don't believe me on the fuel thing, just think of your fuel level gauge in your tank. Your, uh, your, your, the arm with a float on it hangs. There's a little wiper on here, and you see all the little pieces, and as the fuel level changes, it makes contact in all these little pieces. If fuel was a good conductor of electricity, your fuel tank would read empty or full all the time because you'd have even conduction to all these points in here, but you don't. Uh, fuel pumps would probably blow themselves up and melt if, if fuel was a good conductor of electricity. So overall, air and fuel are not very good conductors of electricity. And so when I add non-conductive materials between these two points, the amount of voltage it takes to cross this distance goes up. Just like when I took out the wire, I added non-conductive air in the atmosphere, the amount of voltage it took to jump this gap went up. Now, if I add even more resistance in there, if I put an air, fuel, or rubber, put rubber in between there, then there's just, the amount of voltage needed to go through it will go up dramatically. So when I add boost to an engine, or if my mixture is too rich, I have increased the amount of fuel molecules in there with a rich mixture, which therefore increases the resistance between these two points and can prevent spark from occurring. If I add a bunch of air and a bunch of fuel in between the two of them, and I pressurize them, we'll say at 14 PSI, well, I've added almost an entire atmosphere of air in there. I've therefore made the area between these two plugs more dense. There are now more molecules of non-conductive material in between these two points. Rubber, like I said earlier, is, a, uh, is an insulator because it has lots of molecules that are very dense in an area that don't conduct electricity. So if I add more and more non-conductive material between these two points, the voltage needed to, to jump that gap will go up. Well, if you're already at the limit of your coil packs, how are you going to make your coil packs work in this environment? Well, you could pull some fuel out and lean the mixture out some, remove some of the most non-conductive parts in there, lower the density of molecules in there, that helps a little bit. Or you can reduce the gap, make this distance shorter. Just make this distance shorter, then voila, it jumps the gap. It's really that simple. So people sit there and spit out all these weird numbers and it has to be this and it has to be that. There's, there's no basis for that. It really is a matter of adjusting your air fuel mixture, your gap, or your spark energy to figure out how much it takes to jump this non-conductive gap. I hope that helps shed a little bit of light on the subject. Thank you.